Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the fifth Artist Conversation, organized as part of the programming to complement the exhibition of the 2020 Governor General Awards in Visual and Media Arts, currently installed at the Art Gallery of Alberta. My name is Catherine Croston, and I'm the Executive Director and Chief Curator of the AGA. I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are hosting the exhibition and this webinar from Treaty 6 Territory and Region 4 of the Métis Nation of Alberta. We acknowledge this as the traditional ancestral home of the Nihiwak, Cree, Anishinaabe, Soto, Nisitapi, Blackfoot, Nakota Sioux, Dene, and Métis peoples. And we also acknowledge the many Indigenous First Nations and Inuit people who make Alberta their home today. We recognize that this acknowledgement is just one small recognition of the work we need to do to address and reverse the ongoing impacts of colonization. The Governor General's Award in Visual and Media Arts is a Lifetime Achievement Award that recognizes an artist's career, body of work, and contribution to the visual arts, media arts, and fine craft in Canada. In 2020, eight honor artists were honored for their exceptional careers and lifetime achievements. The 2020 winners are Deanna Bowen, Dana Claxton, Ruth Cuthand, Michael Fernandez, Jorge Lozano Lorsa, Ken Lam, Anna Torba, and Zainab Verji. This afternoon, we are very pleased to welcome Ken Lam. Ken Lum is an internationally recognized artist, having participated in numerous important exhibitions such as Documenta, the Venice Biennale, the Sao Paulo Biennale, and the Whitney Biennial. A longtime professor, he is currently the Chair of Fine Arts at the University of Pennsylvania's Weizmann School of Design in Philadelphia. Ken Lum is co-founder and founding editor of the Yishu Journal of Contemporary Chinese Art, he is a prolific writer and has given keynote addresses at the 2020 Markham Public Art Conference in Markham, Ontario, the 2020 Stichting DDSM WORF Conference in Amsterdam, the 2010 World Museum Conference in Shanghai, the 2006 Biennale of Sydney in Sydney, Australia, and the University's, University's Art Association of Canada in 1997. Since the mid-1990s, Lum has worked on numerous major permanent public art commissions, including for the cities of Vienna, Rotterdam, St. Louis, Leiden, Utrecht, Toronto, and Vancouver. A book of his writings, titled Everything is Relevant, Writings on Art and Life, 1991 to 2018, was published in 2020 by Concordia University Press. More recently, he has completed a feature-length movie screenplay dealing with Chinese contract laborers in the immediate post-Civil War era. Lum also has a curatorial record, including co-curating Shanghai Modern, 1919 to 1945, the Shanghai Biennale, in, Biennial number seven, in, oh, the Sharjah Biennale seven, in Sharjah, United Arab Emirates, and Monument Lab, Creative Speculations for Philadelphia. He was project manager for the Oakwe and Mazur curated exhibition, The Short Century, Independence and Liberation Movements in Africa, 1945 to 1994. Lum is also the co-founder and chief curatorial advisor to Monument Lab, a public art and history collective founded in Philadelphia. This afternoon, Ken Lum is in conversation with William Wood. William Wood is an art historian and critic. He holds a doctorate from the University of Sussex and has taught at universities and colleges in England, British Columbia, Ontario, and Alberta. His research has focused on contemporary art and its display, the history of conceptual and minimal art of the 1960s and 1970s, aesthetics and cultural criticism. Since 1984, Wood has published on recent art in journals, anthologies, and exhibition catalogs, as well as holding editorial positions with C Magazine, Public, Vanguard, Parachute, and Philip Magazine. Wood's research and writing has been supported by grants from the Canada Council, the Ontario Arts Council, the Henry Moore Foundation, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, and the UBC Hampton Research Fund. Wood was a research fellow at the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa in both 1993 and 2007, and in 2002 he was awarded the INCO Award for Curatorial Writing from the Ontario Association of Art Galleries. Before I turn things over to our speakers, just a few notes. Ken and Bill will speak for about 60 minutes, following which we will answer questions. Please enter any questions that you have using the chat function. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank EPCOR, who support AGA online programming through their Heart and Soul Fund, and also the Canada Council for the Arts for their support of the Governor General Awards and the exhibition at the AGA. Please join me now in welcoming Ken Lum and William Wood. Thank you, Catherine. It's great to see you, Ken. Hey, good to see you, Bill. Long time. Yeah. 
Um, I wanted to start with the, talking about the prize itself. I mean, you've received several recognitions in terms of prizes from the Nitition Foundation, the Gershon Ishkovit Foundation, and things like that. But this comes directly from the federal government. I mean, I know you're already a member of the Order of Canada, but what does this mean for you? Well, it means oh, it's an it's it's an honor to be uh, recognized as a as a an artist worthy of the Governor General's uh, award. Um, it's as simple as that. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't change me in any way, um, and it doesn't. Um, but you know, it's it's, it's nice to have. Uh, you know. No, I think that's great. I also think, I mean, don't you think it's uh, a sign of changing times that of the cohort that you have with several uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color, immigrants? Um, well, I mean, possibly, but then I've, I've been working like as an artist now 40 years. And uh, if you look at my CV, it's got a lot of entries in it. So, you know, I've... I've uh, oh, no, it's not that. I'm just mean, do you think that it's a sign of as I say, of changing attitudes towards the type of recognition? Uh, well, I, I hope so. But I mean, I, I don't know how to answer that because I'm, I am an artist of color. And, and yeah. um, but uh, w was that one of the factors in it? I, I have no idea. Right? Oh, I don't, I'm not trying to, in, I'm not trying to intimate right. that. I just meant that, um, is it something? I'm mean, very interested in that question, right? I wouldn't have co-founded Monument Lab if I hadn't. And obviously, uh, well, maybe not so obviously to people who aren't familiar with my work, I've been interested in the question of um, identity formation, uh, you know, subject positions, uh, how, uh, how uh, you know, negotiations of the self from an other pers perspective into communities and, and other groups and so on. That's been uh, almost a leitmotif of, of my work since the very beginning. Yeah, and we'll, we'll get around to that. I also, I was, uh, in reading your book, I was, uh, which is very good, I was, uh, struck by you talking about um, art being a, an aspect of self-definition. That seemed a very interesting and and kind of counterintuitive given some of the uh, non-subjective aspects yeah, of your right. art. Well, I, I mean it in terms, I guess I meant it in a very philosophical sense because, you know, you as an artist, you can't always control the path you're on. You know, you can't control whether a gallery drops you, you know, all the kind of prosaic aspects of, of being in the art system, right? And also the art system itself can, is not something, and I I wrote about this extensively in my book, where many moments where I really had serious doubts whether I could continue on as an artist precisely because it was so uh, linked, identified with the art system so that, that I had to uh, try to find uh, you know, uh, the peripheries of the art system, you might say, and, and to re re reinvigorate my, my, my love of art in the first place. And so uh, when, uh, I guess I, uh, what I meant by uh, uh, that was a philosophical uh, path. As an artist, I, of course, you try to make good work. I, you know, I try to make good work all the time, but some, some works I have to go through, maybe not so good works in the opinion of others to get to better works. And um, I like to think of uh, my work as an earth, right? as something, as a kind of totality, as opposed to, you know, what what was the last hit I did in terms of, um, in terms of an exhibition, you know, and which is which I would say is probably a little bit counterintuitive to the to the kind of business side of um, of how art is directed, and so on. So, but it's kind of, um, but by taking this kind of philosophical position, I've. I've uh, I've found uh, a new purpose for art, and that's why I've kind of not so much deviated, but kind of extended myself in all kinds of other roles, still within the larger realm of art. Well, I think that's interesting. Also, I mean, you're talking about the business side of art, um, in the sense that it's something that uh, art and language spoke about is that people uh, artists don't make works anymore; they make exhibitions. And I think that, and as you say, I mean, that's one of the ways that he, and, and you've very much worked in serial fashion, right? Um, yeah, then, well, well, they do both, right? But because you, you can also make, uh, you know, spectacular, iconic works, which is, which also has its negative aspects, 
the pursuit of something iconic, the pursuit of something spectacular, which more often than not requires uh, a lot of monetization in terms of its production. Yeah. So right, that can also be a, a, a not a good thing as well. That's true. So do you want to look at some slides? Sure. Okay, uh, Helen. So I thought we'd bring in this early work. Right. She's a GG winner, by the way. I know that's exactly why I brought her in. This is Anna Vergi, and it's and it's backwards, by the way. This is what came off the slide, yeah. this yeah. off, off the site. So I'm, I apologize for that. No I haven't seen it for a long time, but um, it's very. I mean, this is a work about identity in a strange way, right? Because it's a corporate type logo. It mm -hmm. looks. I think sort of like what Canada Trust used. It to was it was the Canada Trust logo. Yeah, yeah. Canada Trust doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, it's TD Canada Trust now, yeah. but um, but the idea of combining this very flattering um, studio portrait. Well, well very uh, conforming, I would say. I don't know if it's flattering, but it's it's very. Well, I mean, it's, it's flattering. In, it's a flattering yeah, in yeah, the way sure. that conventional yeah. studio portrait yeah. is. That's yeah. what I mean. Yeah, that's right. Um, and this sort of corporate identity and the individual identity sort of being, I'm not sure if you'd say they're mashed up against each other or. Oh, I think they're brutally abutted up to each other. Sure. Okay. Because some of the other ones, like the one of Ed Gibson, that yeah. was kind of friendly, you know, even though it was based on the CP, I believe, logo at the time. Um, you know, the Demco, uh, Demco Keckles. <laughs> okay. Mean, <laughs> But also, I mean, the media, I mean, and I think this is interesting is that um, in our one of our previous conversations, you said uh, of your student work, which I don't really want to go into, but you said I was working out the sort of typical minimal conceptualist framework sure. of the immediate past because yeah. I mean, conceptual art was maybe dying yeah. when you came into art school. Um, in many ways, I'm still working it out. I mean, I think I think those lessons you, an artist can draw from the avant-garde movements of, of America and also Europe uh, are still not totally resolved. And, and, and but also they provide a kind of fecundity of um, possible procedures for for making art. Right? It, it, it has become a, in, in its kind of neo-conceptual form a kind of lingua franca for that permits a kind of globalized language of art. And and thus uh, there's a there's a kind of a you know transmissibility in terms of uh, artists from all, all all quarters of the world make art and, and and be legible. No, and I also I mean I know we didn't teach together, but we did studio crits together mm -hmm. at UBC, and we saw our students doing exactly that, right? Mm -hmm. So running through the motions. Yeah. Um, but in my case, in, 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 in an interesting way, that's not yeah, a negative yeah. thing. No, no. But in my case, I, I was, you know, I, I, I didn't, I, I didn't, uh, I, I didn't go into art until my last year <laughs> undergraduate, right? And so I didn't know anything about art, and and I was so excited that I felt I had to know as much as possible. I was first of all shocked by the uh, by the claims of art, right? Performance art, male art, all this kind of. Uh, these forms of art, which I, I couldn't believe. Uh, I thought it was a bit of a ruse or something, right? Because I, <laughs> I always had some ability to draw, and because I was a flora and fauna illustrator for the BC government, and um, and then I meet, met all these colleagues, and I thought, well, you can't draw. Why are you even trying to be an artist? It doesn't make any sense. You know, I can draw a horse, <laughs> <laughs> I, but then I realized there was a there was a logic to to the kind of um, what I thought was a kind of irrationality. I think it's also interesting that um, out of that period, and in many ways for a, a long aspects of your career, you followed what I guess Robert Smithson talked about as a post studio practice, um, and I know that. People like Smithson and Dan Graham and Joseph Kasuth are all very important to you mm -hmm. as models, I guess. Um, well, part, I mean, I wouldn't say I was totally post studio. I did, I did have long periods of studio and where I actually made work. I always made drawings. You know, I, I made a lot of drawings. One day I'm not going to show them. Like Smithson, he had, he also did a ton. Yeah, of he drawings. he was he was like Jimi Hendrix. He never yeah, had like, a lot uh, of his hands. Yeah, was huge after he passed away, right? And so on. So, I have a lot of drawings. Um, so I never, it was never entirely like without 
the hand somewhere in there. Um, but I, but also, you know, I, to be honest, I never had money for a long time. So even having a studio was like just, you know, I was always working part time, you know, Burger Chef, uh, I forget, uh, computer something as the, uh, you know, just some inane job. And I had all kinds of jobs like that. So, and I had that from very young on. So, you know, and, and then, um, yeah, it was just, it was just uh, not possible for me uh, for long stretches. To have a studio. I get it. Uh, but I mean, also, but I was thinking on the other hand, um, works like this, or I'll go to the next slide. This are I mean, maybe expensive to make in terms of the uh, no, I say I should... logo, and then and then this is uh, a take on the ready-made the yeah. furniture sculpture, and the idea that you you depend may, very much on standard two to three-dimensional uh, yeah. media. Yeah, I was extending the logic of how furniture is arranged within the kind of rational spaces of the domestic of of homes, right? But um, you know, I rented the furniture here from some company called Grand Tree Furniture Rental. And uh, it took me about, you know, I was working part time and I was saving up. I think it was only, I mean, only, but you know, because the, the dollars changed, obviously. But for me, it was expensive just to make this piece. <laughs> only just to rent, yeah, just to yeah, rent the stuff. And, and no one liked it. Everyone hated it. Well, I remember uh, the first show I think I saw of yours was at YYZ in Toronto, where, if I remember correctly, you had Andy Patton order the furniture over the phone. Yeah. It was yeah. kind of a take on, um, the telephone paintings by Mahali Naj. Right. And then I had a very nasty review. I won't mention the name in uh, C Magazine or one of those. I know. I published that. And um... <laughs> thanks a lot. Okay. <laughs> well, no, I didn't. Rick Rhodes, you right. were your okay. He was the publisher. I, I edited yeah. it. I mean, people just. Uh... And I actually, and, and you know, I mean, I actually thought that Elka Town did. I kind well, of. Well, I was, was referring to Elkatown. Elkatown. I was referring to something else. Oh, another one. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Yeah, no, that's an ugly. Oh no, we don't no, want to no, talk about fine. that. No, <laughs> I, I just I, meant about the first, about that that piece about called between affirmation and contempt or something like that. She called it, and I, or we called it. Right. And I thought that was yeah, it's okay. Yeah, no, no, it had no, its, its no. fit. Right. But you also in your book. You no, know, but I, let me tell you a quick anecdote about this. Uh, I you know I presented a, a a a talk. This is maybe ten years ago now, at a certain uh, museum. And the uh, curator there is very quite well known. I won't mention his name. I, I should because I'll just hint that there's a scandal around him a few years ago. And uh, but um, and uh, afterwards at dinner, he 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 was staring at me, and I and I looked over, and he said, "I don't believe you, right?" And I and uh, I said, "What don't you believe?" Well, you know, during your talk when you showed uh, this work here, he said, "You know, you said that you you picked the furniture because." Uh, your mother would have really loved to have this. I I, I I can't believe that because it's clearly so ugly. This is what this guy said. Oh God! Right, and uh, and I remember thinking it was like that was like one more uh, you know microaggression, but one more moment where I went, okay, this is a lesson in terms of being being an artisan in the art world with its demographics and t you know tastes and so on, which which is often underspoken about. Well, that's what's funny about, I mean, just thinking about the work with Zainab and this work, um, how class is an important aspect of your work and continues to be in many ways. Class uh, and region. Yeah, um, probably more authentically than before. I, before, maybe perhaps I betrayed my class by becoming bourgeois. <laughs> Can we're all petty bourgeois. These like days. I said, it was a function of how much or how little money I had as well, right? Because yeah. Like somebody said, well, why didn't you make those, the Zainab pieces bigger? Why didn't you make more of them? Because I just couldn't afford it, you know? But it is true that after, I'm not sure of the date of this piece, but. Um, this is uh, uh, 1980. Wow. Okay. So it's that early. I was thinking that uh, later in the mid 80s, um, you moved into high, you making furniture sculptures out of pretty high end. Roche Bourbois and things like that, right? Yeah. And yeah. those, and I mean, and those had a totally different, you know, the, I don't want to agree with that curator, but there is something kitschy about this type of arrangement. Uh, 
And that may be class based too. Yeah, I think it's class based, right? Because um, if you, th I was more interested in the inventory uh, of variation, you might say, according to class and taste, which is endless. So that's what I'm more interested in than the idea of, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, kitsch or you know, that's that's you know, Hans Steinbeck's friend of mine, but you know, it was always kind of kitschy, you know, like you had this, you're, you know, you go into the gallery and you're actually slumming in terms of, you know, the the tide box on top of and something. the lamps, a lot of the lamps, yeah, and so on. Right? But I was never, I was really interested in uh, something that was authentically effective, at least effective in my own life. Which I, uh, which inspired uh, this work, and that's why I think, I or I, I, sus I hope that it 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 uh, fomented some degree of um, of unease among the uh, among viewers. Yeah, I think I, I, as as one of them, and and also of course, um, your the arrangement here, and this is kind of a standard type of arrangement. I mean, you did other things too, but it's totally closed off. I mean, it's, uh, and you've taken, I think, elements, particularly from Robert Morris's minimal work. Yeah, and, sure. And, and and use that with the, combining it with the ready-made, and again, it's yeah. kind of mashup of. Yeah, I was drawing, I was drawing lessons from uh, minimal art, right? But, but in a way, kind of, um, um, uh, you know, rent, uh, making it more explicit, the kind of contained, you know, psychological language of that work, which was always about closure and hermeticism and so on. But in a way, uh, and then making that hermeticism explicit, all right? Because you know the private home, the private space is also hermetic in its own way, as a unit of consumption, as a unit of all kinds of private um, comportment, and so on. So I was interested in all those questions. I was also interested in the kind, of, you know, the kind of uh, transitioning of space, uh, you know, that works of art, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, moves through, right? The uh, the exhibition space, the home space, the collector space, and so on. Sure. And also, I mean, I was thinking in many ways that's taking off from themes that were raised by Dan Graham in Homes for America. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. um, not, and, and at the time, not a well-known piece of writing compared to what it is now. Um, um, yeah, maybe. Uh, but I was deeply influenced by it at the time. Well, no, no, that's what I'm getting at. Is that, mm -hmm. I mean, it was very, very forward-looking in that sense yeah. and, and in advancing your critique. Yeah, I mean, it's funny now because I get, you know, I, I, I've probably shown variations of furniture sculptures uh, oh, eight or nine times last year <laughs> because, oh, this is terrific. I love it. Can you do a furniture work? Right? And you, are, right? you still, are you still following the, um, the rental model when you do that? Um, no. Uh, there, I mean, it, for example, I did one at the Swiss Institute in New York last year, and uh, they just bought it on Wayfair. <laughs> it was actually, you know, but it's also kind of interesting because it means the labor that went into it was, was is, is is so little in terms of what you know recompense they received to make these these works, you know. Yeah, and I, I think it's. I mean, also this is a very much the post studio in the sense of a Dan Levin or a Carl mm. Andre mode of you mm. just put together in the gallery. Mm. If it doesn't sell, it goes back to the hardware store or the furniture store or something. Okay, let's move on. Um, mm -hmm. oh, let me see. Where is this next? So I was thinking about these works that sort of come out of the portrait logos. Um, but, I mean, are more declarative in some ways. Um, and about people identifying with different figures like this little girl Tracy Bond mm -hmm. meeting a mascot mm -hmm. on on the street I'm pretty sure that's Granville Street in Vancouver I think it is yeah um and these seem like well how do you think about these are these in terms of kinds of moments of everyday life well yeah I guess because I was interested in the quotidian and the prosaic as well um but uh you know they were obviously uh, mise en scène uh pictures, but I was also interested in, um, uh, you know, the relationship between uh, the textuality and pictorialism, right? Like the text itself, as you know, like when you have a caption to a, to a, to an image, that caption is, is, is only associative because of proximity, but that caption doesn't contain the image and neither does the image contain the text because it's, you can substitute the text, uh, a multitude of, 
of captions for this image, just as you can uh, substitute a multitude of images for this text, right? So there's a kind of uh, oscillation in terms of the opening, uh, uh, you know, the kind of uh, multivalent uh, in interpretive threads that can be uh, produced by by each side. So I was interested in in that as 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 well. But I was also interested in this kind of slightly um, I don't know, this kind of slightly deadpan, uh, you know, um, so, or maybe deadening. Uh, kind of quality, psych, uh, quality to to urban spaces and so on. I mean, the ideal viewing position of this work is right at the right at the fissure between the two halves, right, and so on. But the work itself, specifically, uh, I drew from um, drew from uh, an experience. Uh, you know, I was just having a coffee at Starbucks or somewhere in, on Denman Street, and the A. W. Root Bear waddled down the street, all right, and uh, was handing out coupons like free fries or free root beer. I'm not sure. And uh, a little girl looked like Goldilocks ran out and grabbed the uh, root bear by the leg and said, I love you, A.W. Root Bear, right? That's and, amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. And I went, oh, my God, right? Uh, because, you know, there, and I remember thinking, okay, this is weird. And why was it weird? Because of the kind of usurping of the enchanted, you know, a spree of the, of the little girl towards the animal, the bear. She may light root beer, but I don't think she's enchanted by root beer, right? So, but in, and yet it became appropriated by for commercial ends, and so that inspired this work. And then you also, I mean, the the typeface typefaces um, that you use are well. How would you? Where did you find these, and how did you? What do you think of them? Um, well, I, I, actually, more recent, I, I have invented my own typeface later on. Uh, um, I, I may have done one here like Pepe Pig, but the um, Tracy Bond, those ones are, you know, there's a, a gazillion uh, typefaces. And uh, I don't know, it's just partly like, oh, that, I think that works, you know, and that doesn't work. And I move the meats over or the meats is bigger or the, and, and so on. Well, I guess also, I mean, they, the same, like the, the ported logos, you're getting kind of advertisement aspect into it. These look like the kinds yeah. of, typefaces you might find in the back pages of a newspaper or something. Yeah, and I, but I also w was thinking of like the variations of uh, fonts and um, as cadences in speech, you know, like somehow with the color, you know, the chromatic key shifting, somehow it's like speech and uh, it slows you down or it speeds you up in terms of, in terms of the, you know, the duration you spend uh, even reading five, five words. Yeah, and it's even, I mean, it's very clear here where the, the two nouns, the two proper nouns, um, linked by the verb, but the verb is the smallest, sort of least, you know, um, kind of compressed in a way. And I, anyway. I, by the way, I designed a pig costume too, <laughs> as especially made. So <laughs> that's great. Okay, let's. Um, so out of those, somewhat later, this is the mid nineties. Uh, no, uh, 93 or 93. Yeah. Okay, 93. Um, these know, what, are... is, what is that thing that she's standing at? I, I don't recognize it. <laughs> it says telephone, but it's, okay, it's much too yeah. big to be a phone. Yeah, it's really big, yeah. How did she carry it with her? I don't get it, but okay. That's good, too. I like that. But you made these. These are um, on canvas laminate photograph and canvas uh, they're not on canvas they're on uh, powder coated aluminum oh really okay um and they're and like so you've expanded feet. out from that sort of maybe that advertising mode into a kind of confessional or recording of a subject in this case in crisis they're not all yeah up. i mean they're monologic in this case right many of them were monologic and so it became um i was interested in um uh, you know uh you know uh, limits of speech because you know the, like the lacanian rule is that you know we're made by language right we're, we're produced by language and uh, that's the tragedy of uh, of uh, identity right and subjectivity is that we can't escape language and so on, but but and yet you know the real, which is out there beyond language, is always there. And so I was kind of interested in that in that uh, that that space as well, right? And so because she's losing her uh, capacity to try to convince her 
I suppose, her bow from, um, you know, coming back to her. Um, she, she's, she's losing her sense of selfhood. So I was kind of interested in all, all these types of questions. But I was also interested in, you know, you know, these kind of mantric lines where, you know, there's variations in terms of the text, but, you know, you, you, you know, there's quite a number of words, but it's not, but as soon as you see it, you can apprehend that there aren't a lot of different words, right? And so certain things get reinforced. And because of the kind of mantric um, quality of the text, um, you uh, end up in a kind of circular moment or, or movement back between image and text. And so on, and uh, one undergirds the other constantly. So I was, and, and as a way, and I was also at the time. I remember reading Anne Hollander. It was kind of a, it was a kind of interesting figure because she was a kind of amateur uh, art historian. She never actually, went, you know, has a PhD or any. Or, I'm not even sure she had a graduate degree. And she wrote this great book on what she called duration in Dutch landscape painting and Dutch uh, paintings of little towns at night and the lighting and, and so on was to enhance the sense of duration in front in front of painting. And so I, I kind of I took that and was inspired by that. And I thought, well, if this text keeps kind of repeating itself in variation, then you always return back to her stuck in the phone booth. And stuck in the phone booth, yeah. No, yeah. that's good. I want to show another one of these just to make it clear that you're not just dealing with crisis. Um, and this is, you know, very, in some ways, one could say sentimental, but um, um, bringing a dignity to the sort of everyday. Does that yeah, I mean, she's. I mean, she's a little girl and she's smoking, so there is. Yeah, well, that's, she's that's doing something which is probably not for not proper, and so on. And and, and it's a kind of what is it? An institutional building. It's vaguely institutional and. And you know, I was kind of interested in uh, neoclassical space, which is somewhat shallow, like a proscenium, and then the heavy heaviness of the granite and the heaviness of the brick, the masonry, and and even the slightly discomfortable way of sitting on steps. All of that, right, while she's biding her time, weighs down on her as a kind of, you know, allegory through the material, through the quotation of the materials in, in the building. Right. And so she's just wilding her time. Yeah. And it's well, it's also interesting, as you say, about uh, she's smoking because there's a book called Cigarettes Are Sublime by a girl called uh, Robert Richard Klein. And it's about smoking. And what it says is that smoking is the time to is a time to be out of it. You know, mm -hmm. like you do it. Um, it's just I'm, sort of a break from everything else. One of my favorite rock bands is Cigarettes After Sex. <laughs> <laughs> now I want to turn to these works, which again have this mirroric aspect mm -hmm. that you've actually been quite fascinated by, it seems. Mm -hmm. um, I do remember this picture being critiqued because it was an attractive gallery assistant that was looking at the work. Um, but that was in the bad old days of the 80s. Now, the photographs here are... I, I have one of a, of a man, uh, another gallery assistant as well. Nobody ever mentions that when I show up. <laughs> <laughs> no, it just seemed... I mean, you know, I know. I just meant it... it, it uh, she's it a friend of mine, by the way. She was like Sean Landers' wife, so the artist Sean Landers' wife, so... No, I just meant it. To, I just was raising it to to raise, say, the stakes of some of the pettiness mm -hmm. of, sure. of that particular time. Mm -hmm. And the photographs here, I mean, they're stuck in a mirror the way that you might do it in your home mm -hmm. or school or something mm -hmm. as a kind of memento. They're both anonymous and poignant, I'd put it that way, right? Yeah, and and they don't necessarily come from uh, one source, by the way. You know, right? They, in fact, the, these pictures they all come from multiple sources. But as soon as you put them uh, within the frame, you read them as okay. They are linked within some cosmology of one person, right? One one, one family, one individual, whatever, and so on. So I was interested in that, but I was also, but and and the images, the the pictures are are clipped permanently uh, uh, in a special way. Underneath them, they're always at a ninety degrees. They never, they're never sloppy. They never, you know, just kind of haphazardly placed there. 
believe it or not, I was, I was kind of interested in like uh, referencing in my own way some uh, works by Jules Olitsky and even uh, Michael Snow, these kind of monochromatic paintings with little, you know, that slaps of, of different color along the edge, right? So, you know, as, as a kind of, just as a kind of procedural lesson, but not, not you know, uh, having anything to do with its, its contents of those artists and so on. But I was also obviously, right, I was interested in the camera, but, uh, but not, um, but making a kind of, work that because the camera is nothing but mirror chambers anyway right I, I, i'm talking sure. about home camera and so i was interested in um in doing that without um without actually taking a picture right and when in in the exhibition you would see many uh, of these works with uh, uh portrait size uh mirrors with a single image uh, photograph and um and of course you see yourself uh you know it's recursive right you see yourself in the act of looking, you see other people in the act of looking, and it's like recursivity after recursivity. Yes, and then they also, I mean, this is photographed in a certain way so that it doesn't catch the other ones, but other the installation photographs, you can see mirrors within mirrors. Exactly. So on, which is quite, quite a nice effect for an installation. Yeah. Well, this also, I mean, this takes you a bit back to minimal art, certainly Dan Graham's use of mirrors. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he's okay, but he's more outdoors and you know, in, in in relationship to glass and yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking about that idea of, but I'm also of uh, what? So yeah, capturing also, uh, uh, Michelangelo uh, Pistoletto, or, you know. Or, oh right, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's true. Ooh. So from that, I wanted to move on to one of my favorite pieces, um, which is this is the outside. Mm -hmm. This is the Mirror Maze. Mirror Maze was 12 Signs of Depression. With 12 Signs of Depression. And this is in a Documenta mm -hmm. in 2002. Yeah. Yeah. And so inside there, you get the maze effect mm -hmm. of mise en abeam, of being disoriented, of running into things. And here you can't read the text, but I did bring in one of the features. Mm -hmm. So here we have. I have no friends. Right. Uh, and this is quite, I mean, I find this a remarkably effective piece. Um, maybe it was because I suffered from depression for a long time. And mm -hmm. also I was alone in Castle, which is not mm -hmm. a fun thing to do. <laughs> um, but I think that this, uh, this is one of the first, I guess, even though it was temporary public pieces that you did per se. Um, but it also referenced, I mean, after those sorts of monologic pieces, then this references aspects of mental health and also creates both, uh, as I say, the kind of confusion of being in a maze with these yeah. signs, feeling depressed or yeah. at least alluding to them. It was quite a trying piece in some ways. Yeah, I was, well, I, as I said, I've gone through my own periods. Uh, maybe, I don't know if it was depression. I never went to, went to a, uh, a specialist, let's say, but. Well, you know, periods of uh, profound uh, despair and, and and whatever for sustained periods, and so, but also, but I wasn't, I wasn't even so specifically interested. In that. I was kind of interested in as a kind of a symptom, a despair on a societal level. What you see it, I mean, I'm, I'm in America. It's like basically the you know the 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 mother roost of 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 all that stuff, right? So many people are just you know. Uh, it, 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 acting out in strange ways because there's they have no avenue to properly express it, except maybe a, through you know killing people or something like that, or or drugs, or drugs and and, and so yeah. on. And so I was kind of really interested in kind of this kind of psychological damage, psychological aff affliction that you know the system of social economy, political economy, you know bestows on. On people at a very mass level, right? Well, you know, if you're if you're poor, you know, you you may not even be clinically depressed because you would because you would never have time to be depressed. You're just worried about, you know, you're not anxious, yeah. to work Dunkin' Donuts for a shift, right? So I was kind of interested in all these types of questions, and and it is a kind of sub theme within within my work. I, I did I don't know if you're showing them, but I did like necrology series more recent works uh, which, where I've just basically wrote 
uh, kind of very uh, florid uh, obituaries of uh, fictional figures and so on, which I'm showing uh, soon at the Philadelphia Museum of Art and so on. So, um, yeah, I mean, and, and even, you know, if you go back to that earlier uh, one of the uh, young woman in the uh, phone booth, it's it's a kind of desperation, right? It's a kind of, you know, if if you leave me, I'm finished and so on. So I, was, I, I guess, and, and death, I have to say, you know, finality, thanatos, the eschatological has always been um, a subset, a sub theme. Yeah, yeah. That I've treated my work on a very uh, on off on many levels. Someone said, "How many works on death have you done?" I, I said, "One or two. <laughs> and then I, I counted it. It was like close to ten. <laughs> no, well, if you count the necrology, it's it's close. It's to even 10. more. Yeah, oh, yeah. Um. Now, I mean, here's one of your permanent. Or mostly permanent, unless they're are they still talking about moving it? I have no idea. No one's uh, okay. communicated with, with me. I know that they're building a building in front of it, but yeah. But this is the East Van Monument to East Van, um, East Vancouver. Yeah, that's East Vancouver. Yeah. And someone, someone, um, said, someone said, actually said, uh, what, "What is Evans Street?" <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> but this was I'm. I grew up on the west side, uh, near Dunbar Park. Yeah. It shows, Riley, well, it shows. The Riley Park boys would come and put this all over the community center in the park. Right. And when there were basketball games at Point Grey High, where I went, then you'd see it the next day. Right. And stuff like that. So it really was the mark. And I mean, although people say it's a gang symbol, which is kind of erroneous, I think. Uh, no, I think some gangs probably did, did adopt it. Oh, yeah, definitely. It preceded definitely. the gang, and it was larger than the gang. It wasn't. It wasn't because of the gang either. Yeah, I think it. I think it had something to do with the kind of uh, Catholic uh, immigrant populations in East Vancouver at that time. With the cross, definitely. The cross, yeah. That. Yeah, and and also, and as he also wrote about this, you know, it's often followed with East Van rules, right? Right. So right. It was kind of an assert, a real strong assertion. So well, way. it's a, it's a, it's also ironic because they don't rule. Oh yeah, and, and yeah. Of course, it's a, du a double entendre, right? Like right. rules. You, 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 you. You're now you're an East fan. You live by our rules. And it's also a matter of its faces west, if I'm correct. Yes, it does. So I mean, it's a, it's a kind of a, it's a property. It's a dividing line on Clark Drive. Yeah, between east and west. Yeah, and 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 uh, you know, I'm pleased to say that as soon as it went out, it was embraced. Right. Yeah, yes. I was going to say that's a very popular piece, even yeah. though it's it um, is unlikely, let's say, as public art. It doesn't seem to address things, but then it's become very popular. And yeah. uh, as we say, at least historically, it really has. Right, because I think it taps into a sense of um, beleaguerment. I won't necessarily say grievance, but beleaguerment uh, on the part of a lot of working people, right, who are mostly uh, you know, residents on the east side more so than the west side. Yeah, and also I think um, you know when this was going up was a certain amount of gentrification of East Van was happening, and yeah. it's only accelerated now. So yeah. having this kind of marker of that old kind yeah, of, I mean, uh, people no, people, people kept saying to me, "Oh, you're it's really about pride, and that you're just proud of uh, growing up in East Van." And, and I'd say, I'd, I'd always say to them. I would have rather have grown up in the West Side. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been a lot easier, you know. Well, I like this as well because I mean, as I say, it's sophisticated, but it's also popular. It's not like uh, off-putting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, this is a temporary piece you did. Uh, do you want to talk about this? And well, and this this has to deal with other an, uh, another history of. The lower mainland. Yeah, it was. It was well. It was during the uh, mudflat uh, days uh, in the sixties and seventies, and um, it was it, it was during the kind of uh, tidal uh, uh, zone uh, in North Vancouver, where a lot of people, uh, including uh, David Strang, of uh, one of the founders of um, of uh, Greenpeace, and Tom Burles, and uh, uh, Malcolm Lowry. Malcolm Lowry, right? Uh, all three of them, their homes are were re reproduced here to scale, 
and um, along Georgia Street as part of that uh, VAG, uh, I forget what the space is called, Insight, I think. Offsite, I think. Offsite, so. offsite. <laughs> and so. Insight, offsite. <laughs> uh, Insight is a, is a show. In, uh, <laughs> so, but anyway, so I was kind of, I, I was interested in, um, in, in draw, recalling that moment, not because it was um, a, a nostalgic for it, because I was, you know, just a kid then, but I was interested in, in, in this possibility of living otherwise, right? Which was, and, and the reason why they couldn't get rid of these mudflat homes for a long time was because it was unclear what was proper uh, borders proper to North Vancouver, right? It was never formalized. It was never in terms of, it was, uh, and so because, you know, it was intertidal, the w water came in, the water went out, and it was kind of marshy, right? There was never, uh, no one actually said, okay, this is, uh, civic territory right and because of that you had alternatives uh that eluded that kind of zoning because that zoning didn't exist and then the only reason why it eventually became raised burnt down in fact was because um the uh, municipality of north vancouver including with deep cove and other municipalities formalized um language that said water that extends out beyond the tidal area belongs to the city. Once well, that became formalized, it was like kaput in terms of living otherwise. But this, uh, the title is Shangri-La? Yeah, from Shangri-La to Shangri-La. From Shangri-La to Shangri-La because of the location in downtown Vancouver. Right, right next to the Shangri-La Shangri Hotel. Yeah, hotel and stuff like that. Mm. So you were bringing the kind of, as you say, the t title, the peripheral areas somehow a memento of that into the center also to, to right, but at, you, at a small you, scale. right but as you well know bill i mean people are giddy in terms of uh you know real estate rise and the kind of monetization is kind of crystal city made out of money right crystal glass city and oh, yeah. so i wanted to call up this moment of you know where people didn't seek that people were going okay we're going to recycle we're going to uh, yeah, you know, live within our means. We're 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 going to salvage things and and so on. And also, I mean, very much bohemian lifestyle. I mean, yeah, uh, you know, anti yeah. anti work sort of anti cult corporate and so on. Yeah, and well, so you're bringing us into work this. because they worked hard to build this, right? But it wasn't. It was a kind of anti capitalist way of yeah. defining uh, and temporalizing work. Yeah, and especially about claiming a space without it being mm -hmm. property per se. Yeah. Um, no, I think this is very interesting because, I mean, it is, as you say, very much about that specific real estate uh, mm -hmm. situation that's still going on there. Yeah. I mean, and maybe, oh, well, it must be changing now in the United States in some ways. People talking about um, people moving out of the big cities because of COVID. Yeah, I mean, uh, the hottest, uh, one of the hottest markets for uh, homes is actually New Jer Northern New Jersey because so many New Yorkers are just leaving, right? Yeah, more affordable than you know Hudson Valley. So, and even Philadelphia is is booming real estate, the periphery of Philadelphia because you know you, you can take an Amtrak train ten minutes from where I live. I live in the suburbs and get off at Penn Station within an hour and ten minutes. No, that's I mean, I think that's that's very interesting. The the idea of both of the overheated market that this piece helped to represent and also um it's possible at least aggravation let's put it that way something like that um well i, I was also yeah. something mnemonic right because you know vancouver especially uh you know don't doesn't believe in mnemonic aids <laughs> you know they, they'd rather just forget <laughs> you know, or just kind of bury it under money and and we'll deal with it you know that's very true. Um, now, I want to return turn to Edmonton. Now, this is the Walter Dale Bridge. Mm -hmm. And you're involved in a pretty interesting, unique, as far as I know, type of public art project mm -hmm. where you were part of the design team. Yeah, I was. Yeah, it. yeah it, was, it was my idea to add the passerelle. It's a very, I mean, I, I drive over it a lot, and it's very, very nice. And it certainly mm -hmm. replaces something that was pretty dreadful. Mm. Um, but of course, there's 
the part of that that is not completed. This is a bridge in downtown Edmonton over the uh, North Saskatchewan River, heading between one of the three or four connections between the south side of the city and the north, just for, for, for people who may not know it. But there's also this, mm -hmm. which you designed, mm -hmm. had cast, had mm -hmm. a model made, had cast, and mm -hmm. was to be designed. I made, the, I made the plaster, the original plaster for it, uh, a very small, and then some other guy enlarged it. And enlarged it. But I mean, and this is, was to be installed on either side of the bridge, right? It was, it, well, meant to be. <laughs> meant to be. Yeah. Intended. It's been it's been sitting in a uh, in this kind of ch uh, chain link uh, lot for uh, I think owned by the Edmonton Arts Council for many years. Yes, I know, and I mean, I remember I asked you about this a few years ago. Mm. Um, where is it? Where is it? Because I know um, Catherine Croston, who um, was on the call earlier, mm -hmm. was uh, on the public art board when it was approved. Mm. Um, now you, that is a contentious piece of land, right? Contentious piece of land? What do you mean? Where, around the Walterdale Bridge? Um, no, no, the, no, the, the, you know, I, I went through, um, you know, vetting, I went through community input, uh, including with uh, several uh, First Nations uh, communities and that was, um, that was directed that I should meet by the uh, Edmonton Arts Council. That was part of the procedure and so on. And um, for whatever, and then I didn't hear from them for a long time because partly because the bridge was delayed like three or four years. Yeah, yeah. And then um, I get this um, email that said, um, you know, after a long time, saying, uh, you know, uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe this, was, this is not the right time for this to be interpreted uh, wrongly as as colonial and so on. And I said, well, it is about coloniality. <laughs> it, it is. It's about it's like, and it's called the last buffalo and the last buffalo hunter. No, no, um, uh, the the buffalo and the buffalo fur trader. Oh, fur trader. Okay. Yeah, and so he's he's. It's actually the the fur trader is actually he's sitting on uh, buffalo pelts. Yeah, it's a famous picture, right? At the, really at the uh, apogee of um, the demise of the buffalo, the near demise of the buffalo, and um, and I wanted to have one side of the uh, river and, and, the, and the other one on the other side of the river. And they're very tall. They're like, you know, 11 and a half feet to 13 feet tall. And, um, and they're looking at each other as you uh, cross the passerelle as, as a pedestrian. And I wanted to speak about this dialectic. Can I still use that term or that people? Don't well, we're, no, no, no. I, I, I was, we're not post-Marxist post yet. Okay. I want to speak uh, about this dialectic. Um, about um, you know um, one way of uh, you know the, uh, of, of uh, wisdom about how we should live, you know, epitomized by the buffalo and so on, and then the kind of rap rapacious, you know, business person on the other side, you know, which is still the relationship we have: colonizer and colonized. Indeed, uh, I think nature, nature itself is also colonized, and so. What I thought. Sorry. Yeah, so I was interested in that that question, right? And uh, and that, but you know, in, in the judgment of the Edmonton Arts Council, they say that they, they've talked to all kinds of uh, groups and so on, including First Nations, and and uh, it, they, it may be read as as a, as a kind of affirmation of colonialism, which I want. I don't know. Well, um, what's interesting is uh, that in the old. Uh, Royal Alberta Museum, you would go in and there were huge bronze statues celebrating colonization and mm. the pioneer spirit, which is still really active here. And yeah. um, I can't, I, I guess, I just can't imagine. I mean, it's it pretty brutal. As, as, you know, as, I don't think anyone has ever done a kind of brutal depiction of, a, of someone that was a buffalo killer on mass for money, right? So is it about, like I said earlier, is it about Colon coloniality, yeah, it's about that condition. Sure, still being the real condition. That's what it's about, right? But I also found it interesting that with this and with this piece, and there you are, charmingly. Um, you know, you've gone from. I'm being... in the blue coat, by the way. Pardon? I'm in the blue coat. Well, yeah, you're not the horse. <laughs> um, how you've gone from, as you say, a kind of. 
reliance on strategies from the neo avant garde of the 60s and 70s. And with these two pieces, you've returned, you've turned to, and in other pieces, you've turned to one of the most classic and conventional modes of monument. Right. I, I, and, and, and if you look at Kehene Wiley and uh, all these kind of American artists, they're all doing bronzes too. Yeah, yeah. no, I think it's them, right. Mark Quinn and so on. And so I, I no, I was, uh, but, but, you know, to be, to be, uh, you know, clear, I'm working in the public realm. Which is which has different demands. I'm not working at, you know, uh, you know, some uh, sculpture park. You know, I'm I'm working at um, uh, in a context which is very widely public, right? And so I it requires different registrations of accessibility and legibility. Yeah, and I was going to say that, that, to make it intelligible. And this too, I mean, like the Buffalo piece, this is a kind of piece about colonialism. Yeah, well, it's about the kind of, uh, yeah, it's called the retired draft horse and the last pole log. What you don't see is maybe about uh, 10 meters behind is a is the is a log with a big chain that's being snapped off. The yoke presumably uh, somehow broke and and the horse is kind of in this improbable position of sitting like a sentinel taking in the passing traffic, which is uh, Kingsway in Burnaby. So I was interested in this moment of um you know, uh, uh, when Kingsway was a very important uh, agrarian, uh, you know, by, uh, conduit for right. transporting of goods, right? And of course, before that, it was just, it was forest, it was First Nations and and so on. So it's kind of interesting that transitional moment. Yeah, and this is also, I mean, I know something about horses from my partner and our daughter riding. Horses don't like to sit like this. <laughs> No, they. In fact, they don't sit like that. Man. And um, you, you may see pictures of horses sitting on on the internet, but that's only because the camera captured the horse on the way from up, yeah, yeah, yeah. on the way up or on, on the way down. On the way down, yeah. yeah. So I mean, I think I think it's quite an interesting piece in in that stasis, as you say, that legibility, um, which not all public art addresses at all. Um, really and maybe maybe this is time to talk a bit about Monument Lab. Sure. Um, it's a very interesting project. You want to describe what it is? Yeah, Monument Lab started when I first moved to Philadelphia in 2012. It's almost a decade there. And I was interested in that, um, monumental uh, inventory that dotted the city. There's over a thousand statues in Philadelphia, you know, because Philadelphia was founded in 1646 or 47, something like that. And what's the most powerful city in the in the United States until the early 19th century? Uh, it was one of the most powerful. New York already, you know, uh, more powerful at some point, right, in the 19th century. But it was certainly very important, right? If you look at the Philadelphia story, Spencer Tracy and Kate Hepburn, you know, it's you know, it's basically that <laughs> and New York, right? And um, and so. Uh, but I was kind of interested in the unevenness, I guess, uh, in the system of representation. I was interested in the questions of, well, who gets represented? Who doesn't get represented? I happened, when I first moved uh, uh, there with my family, I, I lived very near the uh, uh, home of uh, Billie Holiday, you know, the great jazz singer, Billie yeah. Holiday, this beautiful voice. And so I saw this little marker, right? Oh, this is Billie Holiday's home. I was born here in this kind of stuff, Philadelphia. And so I went, oh, wow, okay, great, right? And then I uh, walked up to City Hall, not not that far away, and I see this big statue of John Wanamaker, who no one would know, but you know, he was a department store uh, business person who of the name of the eponymous Wanamaker's department store. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, I'm not saying he didn't deserve recognition, I suppose. I'm saying Billy Holiday certainly did. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And it was that unevenness I was kind of interested in that that sparked um, a dialogue I had with a, a, a professor I met in urban studies at, at Penn. And uh, he, he was teaching about this. And, and then I said, you know, you know, what I've always been interested in is doing a kind of exhibition uh, called the Negative History Exhibition. And just about the negative history, history that's, you know, that should be, should be better known, should be acknowledged, should be voices that should be heated and has never been heated and so on. And, um, well, it it it's a long story, but it, it the result was Monument Lab, and it's uh, and it's become incredibly um, 
gratifying, right? Because we've, uh, you know, we received a $4 million uh, Mellon Foundation. Uh, That's great. Right? We are uh, probably going to get, uh, I can't, I'm not supposed to say, but it's a million and a quarter from another foundation and so on. And uh, we've grown to uh, maybe about uh, 25 to 30 people. It's a collective and and we're doing all kinds of projects, including in uh, Antwerp, Munich, uh, you know, Amsterdam, so across the pond. And well, it's so, also incredibly prescient since yeah. we've been seeing the the proposed well, protests, yeah, the kind of monuments, monuments, and yeah, and, we, and also, I mean, I don't, I've only been in Philadelphia twice, mm -hmm. but I was kind of struck by it and Washington D.C. too as being quite southern in a way. Yeah, well, uh, the it, accents it, and the 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 accents and the. Yeah. Uh, and some of the layouts of the yeah. streets and things yeah. like that. Well, Philadelphia was just north of the Mason-Dixon line, which was basically the historical line uh, dividing north and south. And in fact, if you cross the Delaware River into South Jersey, which is parallel with Philadelphia, they were they were on the side of the Confederates, right? So it's a, <laughs> right? And um, yeah, so, you know, like since uh, October, I've done 42 uh, webinars, right? And probably the, about over 30 of them were, were, was on, we're on monuments, and including uh, to, to, you know disposing of Confederate monuments, and renaming projects, and and so on. No, I think it's it's a it's a very interesting and um, nicely public revisionism. You know, yeah. it's not just like oh, uh, I, no, I'm always interested. Let, in let's change myself. the institution, the museum. Yeah, know. I'm always interested in reinventing myself. You know, I mean, I, well, I, mean, I think that's, that, that, that mark, but I'm also interested in in personal reinvention, right? Because you know, like a like the uh, like the Buddha says, if you do not change direction, you may end up where you are heading, right? So it's a, yes. <laughs> well, talking about that, I mean, I, this was the only slide I could find from the early or gallery, hmm. and it just happens to be your work. That you, did you curate this yourself? Yeah, of course. Or did the, you think about it? Yeah, running space. <laughs> I was running the space. Yeah, yeah, and it, so, so it was, uh, as someone who writes space, I, I thought, hey, I gotta write the show. My yeah. I was living in the back and upstairs. Yes, and this was in the Or Gallery on Franklin Street before yeah. it, it was received government funding. It was self-funded. Received no funding. In fact, the County Council actually wrote to me, uh, thinking it was gracious of them. I guess it was. They said, well, we, we've noticed that you've had this gallery now. And, and uh, you know we're really interested in it, and you know you can uh, get funding for this. And I said no thanks. And they said what? <laughs> they said well, you, you can apply for a grant. And I said I'm not interested. And you just have to say they were confounded by that. I was not interested in any funding. I funded it myself. I I, I made the. I mean there was it was a for a short time a gallery uh, for uh, Lai Wan and uh, Sarah Layden and called the Courage of Lassie, this band. But I was the one that put in lights. I made the space much more perfect, gallery-like, the gray floor. I was the person that did all that and then also had a real program. Yeah, and of course, it, it did get start getting funding a few years later after it burned yeah. down. The story, which... Yeah, story of my life, uh, you know, it's like, <laughs> I'm not, uh, like Monument Lab, I, I, I told my partner there, Paul Farber said, I can't get my keep get. I don't have enough time and energy to be so involved now. So successful, right? <laughs> now they they've received so much funding, right? Yeah, but sure, you, there's a lot of it. around. You don't need to pay me and stuff. <laughs> anyway, I thought I'd bring this in because of your history in curating, and also, I believe, maybe I don't remember you did a show in a shopping mall, Poco Rococo, in um, Port Coquitlam, where you yeah. took. Yeah. Youngish, young um, high school students, students, and showed their work. Yeah, from Poco High School. Oh, okay. The art class from Poco okay. High School. And you showed other work, uh, professional oh, artists' work yeah, with artists from you know, like uh, what's the name, Jim Cummings, and remember? oh, Brain Eater, Brain Eater. Yeah, all all, all the kind of artists I thought, um, not necessarily I liked the work. I liked him, but that I thought had some relationship to to suburbia, to high school kids. No, I thought that it's, it's a, again an, a terribly prescient project. Mm. Now, from that, I think uh, we're, we're probably close to limit. Just just in case, I think yeah, we've just got a couple slides left. But um, maybe just talk a bit about um, not just the Sharjah Biennale 
in 2005 where you were the, a co-curator mm -hmm. and you write a beautiful diary about the mm -hmm. situation of being a curator. And it reminded me of Quatermark Medina saying that curation is the um, art of compromise. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's a, a good thing. And also, um, but you were very involved. Well, in maybe it's a compromise of art. <laughs> <laughs> In um, you taught in places like in Martinique. Mm -hmm. You traveled to Africa. You worked with Okwi and yeah. Pizor on an African show. You did yeah. the Sarge Biennale and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So you're part of that global. I, I did a. I organized a conference for the uh, Havana Biennial, um, and uh, yeah, I taught in China and Hangzhou, and uh, you know, I lived. Uh, I spent a lot of time in in um, in, in Sharjah for uh, you know. Close to two years, um, yeah. I, and, I mean that uh, you were one of those, one of the kind of cosmopolitan art people of the arts. I don't know whether I, I, I don't want to be, and I don't mean that. I, in the, I grew up in Strathcona, to you know. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know if I'm cosmopolitan, right? But I, well, but, I meant in terms of this yeah, type travel of uh, uh, travel and uh, collaboration and. Um, yeah, you sure. know the sort of, and mostly on, I would say, on the good side of exhibitions as opposed to the art fairs being the other side. Yeah, um, where you often decry the art world in your book mm. and the art system, as you say, which you see as financial mm. as opposed to or call it commercial. Mm. Um, I hope it was more. Yeah, these places, that. places like yeah. the Emirates and mm. China. Are now very contentious politically. They were contentious at the time. I mean, the uh, exploitation of, uh, especially, you know, uh, dark-skinned people in in the UAE is really terrible. And you said that I think in your diary you said that many of the workers were from India. Is that right? Yeah, from Kerala, which is in the south of India. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and I'm not a very. And they had they had no they had no rights, right? But they were there, of course, because uh, you know the money they get there. Which is a fraction of what MRIs get is still way more than they would get if they were in South India. Mm, but their, their spouses could not be there, their children could not be there, so they're there for the duration of the multi-year contract. Okay, I, mean, I just wanted to touch on that. Maybe someone else has questions, um, but I want to, these two publishing projects. You were the founding editor of Issue, mm. um, the Journal of Contemporary Chinese Art. And you've just published this book, Everything is Relevant, Writings on Art and Life. Now, I was looking at that subtitle, and of course, what did it come into my mind, but uh, someone I wouldn't associate you with, which is Alan Caprow, the blurring between art and life mm. in his his collected writings. Mm. Um, I thought you were going to say Peter Berger or someone. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> the sublation of art and life. Yeah. No, I wasn't thinking of that. But anyway, um, it's, I mean, it's interesting that you did turn to writing in, mostly in the 90s. Mm. Um, I remember the first thing I read of yours was in the 1989 catalog from Winnipeg with those three sort of autobiographical mm. pieces yeah. that really yeah. sort of reset certainly my ideas about what you were up to. Mm. Um, and then you're continuing on with this. Some, uh, a quite good uh, art, art historical article on the Raft of the Medusa by Jericho, um, appreciations of fellow artists, um, and then some, a lot of uh, discussion about globalization yeah. and nationalism, mm. including quite a good essay on um, Canadian nationalism and uh, cultural mm. nationalism. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a big rain. Yes, and I see also, I mean, you, you talked at the beginning about the path, and so we can see here a path of sorts. Mm. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a path in Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris. I thought I, I thought it was path, Paris. Well, I, don't know. Path, I guess. <laughs> and the idea about with issue about going to in the 2000s, turning towards writing, a, having a journal explicitly given over to in English to um, contemporary Chinese art, mm -hmm. which you also write about and, and their education system and so yeah. on in a very yeah. interesting way. Um, now these are, 
I kind they kind of parallel your position, but it also, as you say, you record um, some moments of dissolution. Um, I remember actually being you being with you in Paris in 1996 when you were teaching at the Ecole, and um, you were having. I remember you were confessing, saying you were having a rough time. Yeah. Um, and this is also when you started turning more to international projects. I mean, that you know, being in Paris for a year, I mean, that must have been great. But I mean, going to farther yeah, afield. I'm actually in Paris two years. But, oh, but, really? Okay. But the, the, yeah, I mean, I wanted to, I, I was still interested in art, at least the ideals of art, right? And, um, and I was not in a good mental state at that time. And uh, I wanted to recuperate something of uh, what was it that about art I liked. And, uh, and so I started asking myself uh, uh, questions about where else is there art? Is this all there is to art? And um, I remember meeting Oki and Wazer at that time in Paris. And uh, he was like, I had to buy him a meal because he had no money. <laughs> he was just <laughs> a new guy and no one went to his talk, right? Uh, and uh, I went to it, it was a lunch hour talk. And I went, this guy's amazing, right? And I remember I wanted, I said, I, I, I said to myself, I need to know this guy and I need to be, uh, you know, I need to work with this guy, you know? As a, and it was more, more like a kind of lifesaver. I saw something in him that made things possible for me. That's great. I think Catherine's gonna come in with some questions, but I just wanted to finish with this, which is a kind of congratulations on this. Right. The renaming of the Vit de Vit. Uh, as uh, the Kunstinstitut yeah. Melli, yeah. Yeah. based on this piece. Yeah, that's a whole other story. <laughs> that's in real honor, I think. Thanks, Bill. And of as an anti-colonialist project as well, so it keeps on themes that you're interested in. Hi, Catherine. Hi, thank you both. Um, actually, there are no questions in the chat, so um, okay. if you want to talk, Ken, about the name, the new naming of the Witwit, with this, that would be, I think people would be interested in that. And Bill, you need to sit close to the camera because you're in the dark now. <laughs> yeah. I told you it was going to yeah. get dark. I mean, this happened uh, only a few days ago, the formalization of the name change because the, the it was the formally known as the Vit de Vit Center for Contemporary Art uh, was named after, not named after Wit de Vit, who was like a which, by the way, means whiter than white. <laughs> but Vitt was a colonial officer with the East uh, Dutch East India Company, and which was a uh, proponent of um, you know transactions of bodies, right, slaves, and so on. And so a problematic figure. But the reason why uh, it was named with the Vitt at that time was um, in uh, 1990 was uh, it was situated on Witte Vitt Straat or Witte Vitt Street. And at that time, uh, w this building uh, was in a very somewhat sketchy part of town, quite isolated uh, from downtown. And now it's virtually in the center of Hipsterville there and, and so on. So, you know, because of the kind of uh, social reckoning uh, that's taking place worldwide, right? Uh, BLM and uh, BIPOC and, and, and uh, Me Too uh, and so on. Um, you know, they 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 had they did a search uh, uh, for a new name. Uh, started a process started about three years ago, and uh, and then in the end they they said they called me and said we'd like to call it the art museum or the Kunst Institute or the Art Institute Melly, right? And I said great, and it's, it's because you know this work has been on the side of the museum since the inaugural exhibition. I was the inaugural exhibitor for the, the formerly known as with the Vit Center for Contemporary Art. And it was a billboard. There was a, there was a billboard frame there, and they had this idea to um, they had this idea to uh, you know advertise the show, right? And for whatever reasons, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm glad I did make that decision. Um, they they said, well, we'd like to show like uh, an image, Melly Shaman. You have your name, Ken Lum, and dates of the show, and so on, and that will accompany every sh sh show. And I said. Um, how about just the work without my name, without any other uh, extraneous information? And they said, sure. So they put it up. And then when my show came down two and a half months later, they, the billboard came down. And then when the billboard came down, uh, the Vit de Vit received 
uh, a lot of phone calls and even letters demanding it be put back on. <laughs> something which I obviously I couldn't anticipate. And then I received a phone call in Vancouver and from uh, one of the officials, not the curator, one of the officials there. And 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 uh, I said, after a conversation, I said, why? What's going on? Right? And I remember being stunned by it. And they said, well, the best uh, reason uh, for the demand to put it back up is came from one woman who said, Every city needs a monument to people who hate their jobs. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so it's been up since, and since then it's been hundreds and hundreds of images on Flickr, Facebook page, and um, you know, it's uh, there's a conference in terms of job dissatisfaction at Harvard University a few years ago, and they they use this they asked them to write for the image to as part of the poster and. It, it's taken on a life of its own, so it's great. It's now the Melly Art Institute. That's great. So, Kathy, uh, do you have any questions? Yeah, there is a question that just came in. Um, the question is, hi, Ken. Mm -hmm. I wonder, your work is a straightforward response to racism and stereotypes of all races. For example, your artist book, Speculations, There Is No Place Like Home 2010 and Coming Soon and also some of the works in the portrait text series? Um, it's, a, it's a response to the, uh, to the fact that humanity is comprised of many, many different shades of color and, and many differences in terms of gender and many other differences in terms of whatever. And so it's a response to, to that, right? But I am but I, also, also very interested in the way in which uh, you know certain imaginings of race takes place, and they become internalized, become naturalized, and they become even uh, uh, tropes. So I'm interested in that, but I'm also, but I'm not just interested in replaying that. I'm interested in challenging it, upsetting it. Right. So the way to upset that is to dislodge the fixity of those tropes. Is to um, is to you know throw doubt into uh, you know st stereotypic forms. Thank you. Uh, there is no other. There are a number of thanks, but no other questions. So, okay. well, should we wrap it up? Yeah. Well, with that, I would just thank like you very much, to... Ken. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. En enjoyable. Come to thank you. That's your to family. Europe. Yeah. Come to Philadelphia, where it's. Uh, cold and uh, two degrees Celsius here. <laughs> anyway, on behalf of um, the Art Gallery of Alberta and all of our audience members, thank you both uh, well, for being here today. I, I want to give a shout out to Serge Gobo. I can't see his name there if he's still there. Hi, Serge. How are you? Hey, Serge. And uh, Michael Turner as well. Yeah. yeah, Michael Turner actually had a question that maybe I'll convey to you <laughs> <laughs> through the chat. <laughs> Um, yeah, anyway, again, thank you both. Thank you very much, Ken, and thank you for um, all that you are doing for um, artists for, in Canada and abroad, and it's wonderful to have this opportunity to have you here uh, speaking with us. Thank so you. again, thank you very much, and congratulations on the Kunst Institute Melly and also on the Governor General's Award. So, thank Great. you. Cheers. Good night, everybody. See you later. <laughs>